facing. The cars move back a bit. It's hard, but you're doing a great job. We all are doing our best. And you know, when we do our best, God does the rest. And we are in his hands. We are of the kingdom of God. We're children of the Lord. Don't limit yourself to all the things you hear and see. Use wisdom, but just remember who you are. Just remember your name. Just remember who God calls you, his very own. And how, how would I not care for my own children? If I knew they were struggling, if I knew I had to give them some medicine because they have a headache or whatever, I'm right there as a mother's heart. The father and the mother's heart of Almighty God is there for us and he is going to take care of us. And so I just want to pray a blessing this morning over all of us together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's just close our eyes. It's sometimes good to close our eyes because don't look at me. Look at the Father. Close your eyes. See him. See his face. See his love. See his compassion. See his care for you. See him. And I just pray a blessing over this morning gathering and over everyone that's gathered here in Jesus' name. I just pray like a safety net pulled right over this area in the presence of the Lord, in, in his bubble, in his presence. There's peace, there's joy, there's no fear. This is our time to worship the Lord. This is our time to love one another. This is our gathering time in his presence. So we just protect this place. And we protect everyone here in their health. That you would be strong. And that we would make a difference and a testimony to Jesus Christ in every way. I pray this in your name. I bless you, Lord. I bless you, Lord. Let your presence come, Lord Jesus. Let your presence settle like the dew in the morning. Let your presence just settle in our hearts. Settle the dew of the to preach into a used car lot. <laughs> Bless the Lord. But worse things have happened. Better a used car lot than no car lot. Hallelujah. And Sandra, you will be missed. Your cheerfulness, your cheerful disposition. And probably not only by the church family, but by your workmates as well. <laughs> Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. So how many days is it since we celebrated Easter? Come on now. Can I hear a unanimous number? It is 50 days since we have celebrated Easter. 
And that's notable. When the actual event happened, Jesus departed to heaven a week ago last Friday. That is very notable. And for 10 days, he met with his disciples and, and other followers. He had many followers. Uh, at one point, it's recorded that he had met with 500. And obviously there were, there were some cisterns involved there as well. Hallelujah. And so here we are, and we remember, I remember what happened 50 days after Jesus ascended. And I, I want to focus at, at this point on one verse. During that 10-day ten, ten period from when he ascended to when the Holy Spirit came, um, in, in one of his discussions, he, he said, and he, he talked about the coming of the Holy Spirit lots during that 10-day period and prior. During that 10-day period, he said, when this happens and the Holy Spirit comes, you will receive power when he comes upon you. And that word power, it, it can be translated different ways, what it meant in that day. What well, one of the, the ways that it can be translated is the ability of God. You will receive the ability of God after the Holy Spirit comes on you. Another variation of that word is the word from which we get our English word dynamite. You will receive the kind of explosive power which is like unto dynamite. Uh, everyone's journey is unique. Everyone's spiritual journey is unique. And, and it's unique to the person who has that experience or who is walking out their journey. Some people have a very dramatic encounter with the Lord and, uh, and with the Holy Spirit when they initially encounter, and some don't. And for the one who has a quiet encounter versus the one who has a very dramatic encounter, one is no more special than the other. They're all the same in the Lord's eyes. My personal story doesn't include much drama at all. And you could possibly understand why. Maybe God gave up on trying to do drama with me, I'm not sure. Or he knew better not even to try, I'm not sure. Nonetheless, my journey doesn't include much drama at all. But I have had several encounters with the Holy Spirit specifically that reshaped me on the inside and changed the tra trajectory of my life's pathway. Starting on a Tuesday night, October 23rd, 1973, a very confused, fearful, insecure individual, me, no direction in life, very lost, very aimless. I had an encounter with the Holy Spirit that entirely changed my life. And it would be safe to say that that my life was put on a pathway that led to change. That would be a better way to put it. Um, and I'm going to cite four <laughs> encounters here. I could talk an hour or more about each one, what led up to it, the surrounding uh, 
surrounding situations and head games that I had to deal with in, in accepting these changes. The second one was when I, I, I felt the Lord telling me, well, I didn't acknowledge that it was the Lord. I just had this nagging thought that I couldn't get rid of to go to Bible school. I could talk a long time about that because I was not a candidate to stand in front of a pulpit, in front of people. <laughs> that was a long, enduring struggle, and I finally gave in. In my second year, I had another appointment, a long appointment, and the Holy Spirit dealt with something um, in my personal life that if I wouldn't have dealt with this, I would not be here. And it was my opinion of myself. For many years, I entirely rejected who I was. I, unless you've been there, you don't understand. I rejected myself. A long process. I sat in God's office, and he said, you need to deal with this. And I did, and that's why I'm here. Another encounter, one that involved us as a family, is why we're here living in this community. In the spring of 2001, well, it wasn't spring yet, it was February. First Sunday in February, through the ministry of prophets, it was confirmed to us that what we felt in our hearts was the Lord. So this morning, I draw attention to the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. In Acts chapter 2, the, the actual event is recorded. Many Christians believe that because the upper room is referred to earlier in chapter 1 that this happened in the upper room? Probably not. There's too much that would indicate otherwise. They were praying probably in the temple because it was the Feast of Pentecost, a very important feast to the Jewish people. And they were by all indications, in the temple. And something very unusual happened. Something very unusual happened. Not, and, and I'm not referring to what happened when the Holy Spirit came on these people that were praying and they they began to speak in, in other tongues and, and some in languages of the folks that were around. But there, there was something that fell upon that area and people were convicted in their hearts and they wanted to repent. It wasn't like they had to they wanted to and 3,000 gave their hearts to the Lord that morning that morning very unusual it's not like this hasn't happened since in 1995 June 16th on Father's Day after two years of prayer for revival in Brownsville, Florida, a revival broke out. And I've talked to people who were there 
and you could not go near that place without being overcome of wanting to repent. Every service, it was like you got born again. You couldn't go near there without just being overwhelmed with just wanting to make it right with the Lord. And that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. And that's why out of many thousands of people, 3,000 of them, that morning gave their hearts to God in a way that was not possible before. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. In verse 2 of Acts chapter 2, it says the whole house was filled. And this is one of the reasons why it's assumed that they were in the temple because the temple is referred to in the New Testament by the house. So the whole house was filled with the presence of God. That word filled means to be filled inwardly. There's two words in the Greek language which are only translated filled in English. That word in, in verse 2 means to be filled inwardly. In verse 4, it uses the word filled again. It says they were all filled and began to speak in other tongues. That word filled means to be filled outwardly. Much like how, say, a dining room is filled with ch uh, chairs, couches, etc. for a certain service. Or how a kitchen has utensils, implements, there for a certain service. In the same way, this word filled means to be filled outwardly, where the Holy Spirit came on these people outwardly to be equipped for a service. This is what happened in the Old Testament with David, Samson, Elijah, Gideon, when they did amazing feats for the Lord. The Holy Spirit would come on them, and it reads, it would come on them, and then they would do their job, and the Holy Spirit would lift. When the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, it came on them in the same way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sure is nice that the wind is not blowing my notes. That's refreshing. Bless the Lord. And this would explain some of the controversy, confusion about don't I have the Holy Spirit when I get born again? Certainly you do. It's on the inside. Is there something more that equips one to do greater works for God and experience in the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. There is something more. It's the Holy Spirit on the outside. Two verses I'd like to draw attention to. After this happens, and and some of these people who were baptized in the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in other tongues, some of them spoke in languages that were known. Keep in mind, as we gathered here this morning, we came from our individual homes from various parts of the community, and here we are. There were many thousands of people who came to Jerusalem for this feast. They came from 14 different locations speaking different languages. They were all Jews, but some lived here, some lived there, some lived here. From 14 different locations they came and they heard 
these people speaking in their language glorifying God. Most unusual. And there would have been this overwhelming feeling of something that the world had never felt before. Never felt before. A, a wanting to repent. And in verse 12, it says that people were amazed and perplexed and they asked one another, what does this mean? They were amazed and perplexed. What does this mean? And for me this morning, I feel very inadequate to talk about the Holy Spirit, to address this message, to talk about this occasion when it happened. I feel very inadequate. I, I just want to stare off in the heavens and ask the question, what does this mean? What does this mean? Because I don't have a lot of answers. But when I look at what's happened in my personal journey, I have to reflect inward and I'm still struck with the same question. What does this mean? What does this mean? Like, you can't imagine what happened on October 23rd, 1973 on a Tuesday night to a very, very, very lost, lost, confused person. And the next day I talked to three people about God. And, and, and here I stand today. And I'm just... struck and overwhelmed with this question. What does this mean? And so there were those on that day they asked one another, what does this mean? And wouldn't it be special if that's where this journey ended, or this story, or this, this day, if that's where that would have ended? That would just be utterly spectacular. But in verse 13, it says, some, however, made fun of them and said, oh, on this special weekend when everybody's getting together from all over the known world, they've been partying, they're drunk. Some, however, made fun of them You know what really strikes me from verse 12 to verse 13 is that all these people were Jews. There were no Romans in that crowd. There were no Canaanites, Jebusites, Hittites. They were all Jews. Please don't sit on your fob. <laughs> Hallelujah. We could do an altar call now if uh, somebody wants to. Okay. We'll pass on the altar call. So what's so staggering 
that morning at nine in the morning some said what does this mean and some said ha 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 they've been drinking and they were all of the same people they were all Jews Something that troubles me deeply is that every revival, every awakening, every outpouring of the Holy Spirit since that one has been met with the same group of people. Some said, what does this mean? And some made fun of it. And those two groups of people are the same people. It is never, and well, I shouldn't use the word never, but it is very unlikely that non believers, people who do not do religion, church, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, it is very unlikely that those people will criticize an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Very unusual. Very unlikely. So I want you to answer three questions, four questions for me. Which revival is associated with holy rollers? Louder. Pentecost. Pentecost. Which revival is associated with barking like dogs? Specifically, which revival? Toronto. Toronto. It's amazing that you know this. Which revival is associated with blab it and grab it? The word faith. Like, anyway. <laughs> and one that you were not a part of, which revival had the word Protestants associated with it? They were called protestants. They were protesting. I know you weren't there. Martin Luther. Protestant. They were called protestants. They were protesting. So every revival has the association of having be, been made fun of. And some said, what does this mean? When I was in school, there was one fellow, he was of a particular denomination. When he learned that I was Pentecostal, he made fun of me and used all the words that are associated with being Pentecostal. Walking on the walls, swinging on the chandeliers. Oh, for those days, they were glorious. <laughs> Holy rollers. Oh, yes. Those were good days. Except I never seen any of that. But that stigma was still there, amazingly. What church do you think this guy goes to today and has gone for many years? The church we came out of, that we left in Chilliwack. It, it, it leads me to this question. 
Can we offend the Holy Spirit by our criticisms? When this fellow Harold started going to a church that was far more exuberant and vibrant and out there than any Pentecostal church, did he have to repent? Was he convicted? Has he ever even thought of it, what he used to carry, his attitude? And for ourselves here, we are Christian people. When something unusual happens, when differing opinions are present, where is the safe place? Where, where can we go so that we would not offend the Holy Spirit. It's verse 12. They just asked the question, what does this mean? And left it there. So how do we deal with what is unusual, what is different? When there's differing opinions, and we have a classic example right now with the coronavirus, differing opinions. How do we deal with differing opinions? Let me be clear. Opinions is like the nose on your face. Everybody has one. Opinions proves this. You're human. And that's all it proves. You're a human being. That's all it proves. Jesus never said, value and trumpet your opinions. He commanded, love one another. Amen. Amen. And while the day of Pentecost is associated with an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, what we deal with this very day, why we're gathered in this very manner, is associated with very strong opinions. It only means you're human. It means that somebody else has an opinion as well. Just like everyone has a nose, everyone has an opinion. Love unites, opinions divide. And whether we would spend any more time, and I won't, about the foolishness of this virus, and I'm referring to the opinions, or whether we switch back and talk about various opinions within the Christian world about the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. May we never in the Christian world 
pertaining to the function of the Holy Spirit in someone's life. May we never divide because of opinion. Never. Capital N-E-V-E-R. Never. We unite on love. Opinions hold no weight or value. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In conclusion, Jesus said something when he, before he was crucified, talking about the Holy Spirit. He made a very unusual statement. Even to this day, for us, it's unusual. But to his audience in that day, it must have, must have just been so confusing. And now I'm reminded of what I've said a few times to somebody. So what are you talking about anyway? I won't mention no names. But let me fill in on the details. Jesus said, it's better for you that I go away. Like, are you kidding me, Jesus? Like, yeah. can anything be better than, than this? Like, you do the food thing, you do the walking on water thing, like, like, like the demon thing, like healing lepers, like, Serious Jesus and there's something better than this We probably wouldn't be sitting here if Jesus wouldn't have left Completed his work and the Holy Spirit came we probably wouldn't be here Probably There's a very good likelihood we would have never heard about Jesus and experience what we have come to experience probably not without question a third of the population of the world would not identify as Christian Christianity would not be the biggest religion if Jesus would not have left completed what he had to do and the Holy Spirit came without question and so when he said it's better for you that I go like he knew something that we had to learn about it had he not left there would be no New Testament there might have been the first four Gospels talking about somebody would have wrote a book on Jesus. Just like somebody writes a book about Superman Joe Blow because he's such a great guy and he's still alive and somebody writes a book on him. So there could have been writings about Jesus similar to the Gospels. Although not like the Gospels because there'd be lots left out because Jesus wouldn't have got crucified and etc etc it would just be like a biography of some great person there would be no Acts Romans Galatians Ephesians Thessalonians there would be no book of Revelation there never would have been a Peter or a Paul or a John <laughs> there never would have been an Emra or a Ferdy or a Brian in the way we know one another now oh I'm not saying we wouldn't have been born we would have but where we've come to in our spiritual journey there definitely wouldn't have been a me. 
you have no idea where I would have ended up. Or you, I know some of your stories. It's better for you that I go away. To comprehend the difference, the impact, how the, the journey of the people of the world was just changed from going this way to just going a different way and that we carry a third of the population of the world with us. <laughs> it's just, it's just hard to try to comprehend what happened on that day that's recorded in Acts chapter two, how the world, the, the trajectory of the human race, how it was so greatly impacted and just altered, just altered. Hallelujah. You will receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will receive power. The ability of God. The ability to change. The ability to become a different person. The ability to respond to being born again. To repenting. To walking softly before God and man. <sighs> if only our imagination would allow us to entertain how we have been benefited by through the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. 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 My final thought, and this is a beautiful setting here. My, my final thought, is that we would be people who would reflect verse 12. Read the whole chapter when you go home. <coughs> Perplexed and amazed, they asked one another, what does this mean? What does this mean? Hallelujah, what does this mean? And may we continue, as this church family so well does, to trumpet the cause of love and to demonstrate it in a way that is impacting and is noticeable. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, this morning our hearts are overwhelmed. We are quietened within when we consider the role that your beloved Holy Spirit plays in our lives and in the world. And we are very confident that you hold the final trump card in your hand. And through the demonstration and power of the Holy Spirit, your will will be accomplished in this world. Hallelujah. In spite of all the darkness that looms in front of the Christian church and its values, we are confident that you are Lord and that your power is greater than any other power. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. And we covet in this community a fresh outpouring, 
a fresh outpouring that would cause the largest halls to be too small. A fresh outpouring. We covet that. In the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 We covet that. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Be blessed. Have a great week until we meet again. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, we can't serve coffee, but maybe we could have a jerry can and give the vehicles a little shot. <laughs> that would be special.